an indefinite number of times. In fact, we've been taking birth since beginningless time, according to the text, taking one form after another, not always human forms. We've taken many forms as shown in this wheel of life. The wheel of life is in the held by the fangs of Yama, the Lord of Death. It's sort of an archetype of death that was found in India even before the Buddha, but they also use it, the Buddhists also use it to illustrate the cycle of birth and death that we're all entangled in. So there are three higher realms. Um, originally there were two, the gods and the humans, but then the god realm got divided into two, the long life gods and the demigods. The long life gods live a very long time. And the demigods are sort of like the Greek jealous fighting gods. They're sort of like us, but they're more powerful. And then over to the right, the human realm, where the lifespan is something like a hundred years, somewhere between 70 and 100 years usually, whereas the gods can live for 20,000, 40,000 years. Now these are the portrayal of the lower realms, the unfortunate realms of existence, namely the animal realms, the hungry ghost realms, and the hell realms. And they're also portrayed in detail. Well, we don't want to go there. <laughs> actually, some people think it would be nice to be born as a horse or a bird. But actually, if we watch them, we, we can see that their lives are full of various mm, fears and hardships. And also, they live a very short lifetime, and then they have to take rebirth again. So also, in the course of an animal lifetime, many are carnivores. So they're constantly engaged in killing in order to get their food, which creates karma, which has consequences. So best, the best possible rebirth is a human rebirth, which we are fortunate to have at the moment. Uh, but we have to recognize that it will not last forever, so we have to make it meaningful while we have the chance. Now, what makes the wheel of existence spin around and around and around since beginningless time until now, or until we become liberated from birth and death, liberated from samsara, as they call the wheel of existence? Well, there are these the delusions of the mind, here portrayed as three, greed, hatred, and ignorance. Okay, so the rooster represents greed, the snake represents hatred, and the pig represents ignorance. So due to these and other delusions, also jealousy and pride and so forth, we keep spinning in the wheel of existence. Based on our delusions, we engage in um, unwholesome actions that have consequences that um, may be pleasant or unpleasant, depending on the quality of our actions. So we can see death as a, as a disaster, a tragedy, or we can see it as the opportunity of a lifetime. So at the time of death, we can actually gain insight into impermanence. I mean, up close and personal. We can gain insight into suffering because often the process of aging and dying entails pain and suffering. So that's an important realization. We can practice patience because we don't always die on our own time. It may take months or, or years, the process of aging and death. We can practice compassion so we're not the only person who's facing all of these sufferings. There are 8.2 billion uh, human beings on Earth who are facing all of these different problems, but far more animals than humans. Oh, they outnumber us, and the insects outnumber us, hands down. At the time of death, we can also practice momentary awareness. And I can tell you from my personal experience that this is a really valuable practice. 
Mm, I was bitten by a snake and almost died, spent three months in the hospital. And this practice of momentary awareness, just staying in the moment, was so important. And more recently with the skull bladder surgery, which I barely survived, that also this practice of momentary awareness was so meaningful. And they say, at the time of death, we can even achieve awakening. If we've practiced mindfulness well, if we've practiced meditation and learned to tame our minds, then it's possible to achieve liberation or perfect awakening. So the idea is that the way we die will reflect the way we lived our lives. So this is what we mean by making friends with death, is that we learn from our um, understanding of death, that the way we live our lives will have a huge impact on the way we die. Um, especially in terms of training of the mind. So how do we do that? Here's some examples. Uh, one would be mindfulness of breathing, just simple anapanasati, aware that we are breathing out, aware that we are breathing in, this kind of attentive, uh, mindful practice so is, is very, very important and will be very, very useful in facing death. Second, the meditation on loving kindness. We can meditate on loving kindness every morning and every evening. We can practice loving kindness when we have a difficult encounter. Uh, when we have a job interview, we have a meeting with someone we don't get along with, our boss or who, whomsoever, then the meditation on loving kindness will be incredibly valuable. You can also meditate on the stages of the dying process. Now, it's probably in the Tibetan tradition that this meditation has been almost fully um, preserved and practiced over many hundreds of years. And so we'll look at that in a moment. Uh, we can chant sacred texts uh, to remember the Buddha's teachings, we can also recite mantras, which helps to keep the mind focused. In the Tibetan tradition, there's also the tradition of poa, translated as transfer of consciousness. Uh, it's a complex pr practice where we visualize gathering all of the winds of the body into the right, left, and central psychic channels and then bring the, those winds up to the top of the head, uh, practicing for the moment of death, at which time we'll be able to transfer our consciousness uh, to another rebirth. Um, in the Tibetan and as well as the Chinese and Japanese traditions, the idea is actually if we don't achieve enlightenment in this lifetime, then we would hope to be reborn in a pure land where practicing the Dharma comes very easily. Everyone's practicing their bodhisattva teachers there, um, Buddhas there who teach us and there are no interferences. You know, you don't have to work, you don't get sick, you just practice Dharma 24 seven. So these are some of the various practices that people, uh, Buddhists may use in, in facing death. So, of course, we can't learn these all at the last moment. We have to practice them while we're still healthy and, and hearty and have energy to practice. And then they'll really come in handy, uh, as I know from my own experience, as we approach death. So I'll take you on a, a, a little excursion around a couple of Buddhist countries. Um, first to Laos. Uh, a Theravada country uh, where I visited uh, a few times and I was fortunate to participate in a funeral for a man who was not very old, uh, but he passed away, um, sadly, in a brothel. Yeah, it was kind of embarrassing, but the family rallied around 
and uh, did all of the, the family was prosperous, and so they did all of the rituals necessary. Uh, and placing the, the body in a, a mock stupa, or reliquary, uh, prior to the crem cremation. Um, on your left, you'll see, on the left of the photo, you'll see the male relatives of the deceased who ordained for a day, they ordained for 24 hours in order to accumulate merit, which they will then share or dedicate to the deceased. And they'll put the, the little mock stupa on a truck bed and take it down to the nearest temple for cremation. So here's the son of the man who passed away and his nearest relatives, all the males. Uh, the, the women will also take eight precepts, same idea to create merit on behalf of the deceased, but they don't shave their heads. So then they put, once the stupa is placed in the courtyard of the temple, on the lawn of the temple, then they attach a string that's sort of like a rocket that will ignite the stupa and the corpse that's inside. So this is the way they do the cremation. Okay, let's go to Vietnam then. And one very famous uh, death in Vietnam, of course, was in 1963 with the immolation of a monk who was protesting the oppression of the Buddhists under the Catholic dictator Diem. And to illustrate his, the, the grievances of the Vietnamese people, he set himself on fire at an intersection in the middle of Saigon. Now this was a, a time most of you won't remember, but I was a student at that time. And when we saw these images flash across the TV screen, we took to the streets to try to end that war. So in the end, three million people died, but it could have been many more. And we felt that we had to do something. And so we did our best to try to advocate for peace. And um, it's a very sad episode in human history, but that's an example of, of um, self-immolation. That Where does this fit in? The Buddhists do not condone suicide in any form. Uh, but in this case, the Vietnamese people regard him as a bodhisattva, someone who was willing to sacrifice his own life for the benefit of countless others. It's a very controversial point. And of course, if we look at the topic of, of death and impermanence, we need to look at the, at the sticky issues also, such as suicide an indefinite number of times. In fact, we've been taking birth since beginning this time, according to the text, taking one form after another, not always human forms. We've taken many forms as shown in this wheel of life. The wheel of life is in the, held by the fangs of Yama, the Lord of Death. It's sort of an archetype of death that was found in India even before the Buddha, but they also use it, the Buddhists also use it to illustrate the cycle of birth and death that we're all entangled in. So there's three higher realms. Um, originally there were two, the gods and the humans, but then the god realm got divided into two, the long life gods and the demigods. The long life gods live a very long time. And the demigods are sort of like the Greek jealous fighting gods. They're sort of like us, but they're more powerful. And then over to the right, the human realm, where the lifespan is something like a hundred years somewhere between 70 and 100 years usually, whereas the gods can live for 20,000, 40,000 years. Now these are the portrayal of the lower realms, the unfortunate realms of existence, namely the animal realms, the hungry ghost realms, and the hell realms. And they're also portrayed in detail. Well, we don't want to go there. <laughs> actually, some people think it would be nice to be born as a horse or a bird, but actually if we watch them, we can see that their lives are full of various fears and hardships. And also they live a very short lifetime and then they have to take rebirth again. So also in the course of an animal lifetime, many are carnivores. 
So they're constantly engaged in killing in order to get their food, which creates karma, which has consequences. So best, the best possible rebirth is a human rebirth, which we are fortunate to have at the moment. Uh, but we have to recognize that it will not last forever. So we have to make it meaningful while we have the chance. Now, what makes the wheel of existence spin around and around and around since beginningless time until now, or until we become liberated from birth and death, liberated from samsara, as they call the wheel of existence? Rather, these the delusions of the mind here portrayed as three, greed, hatred, and ignorance. Okay, so the rooster represents greed, the snake represents hatred, and the pig represents ignorance. So due to these and other delusions, also jealousy and pride and so forth, we keep spinning in the wheel of existence. Based on our delusions, we engage in um, unwholesome actions that have consequences that um, may be pleasant or unpleasant, depending on the quality of our actions. So we can see death as a, as a disaster, a tragedy, or we can see it as the opportunity of a lifetime. So at the time of death, we can actually gain insight into impermanence. I mean, up close and personal. We can gain insight into suffering because often the process of aging and dying entails pain and suffering. So that's an important realization. We can practice patience because we don't always die on our own time. It may take months or, or years, the process of aging and death. We can practice compassion. So we're not the only person who's facing all of these sufferings. There are 8.2 billion uh, human beings on earth who are facing all of these different problems, but far more animals than humans. Oh, they outnumber us and the insects outnumber us hands down. At the time of death, we can also practice momentary awareness. And I can tell you from my personal experience that this is a really valuable practice. I was bitten by a snake and almost died, spent three months in the hospital. And this practice of momentary awareness, just staying in the moment, was so important. And more recently with the skull bladder surgery, which I barely survived, that also this practice of momentary awareness was so meaningful. And they say, at the time of death, we can even achieve awakening. If we've practiced mindfulness well, if we've practiced meditation and learned to tame our minds, then it's possible to achieve liberation or perfect awakening. So the idea is that the way we die will reflect the way we lived our lives. So this is what we mean by making friends with death, is that we learn from our um, understanding of death, that the way we live our lives will have a huge impact on the way we die, um, especially in terms of training of the mind. So how do we do that? Here's some examples. Uh, one would be mindfulness of breathing, just simple anapanasati, um, aware that we are breathing out, aware that we are breathing in, this kind of attentive, uh, mindful practice so is, is very, very important and will be very, very useful in facing death. Second, the meditation on loving kindness. We can meditate on loving kindness every morning and every evening. We can practice loving kindness when we have a difficult encounter. Uh, when we have a job interview, we have a meeting with someone we don't get along with, our boss or who, whomsoever, then the meditation on loving kindness will be incredibly valuable. We can also meditate on the stages of the dying process. Now, it's probably in the Tibetan tradition that this meditation has been almost fully um, preserved and practiced over many hundreds of years. And so we'll look at that in a moment. Uh, we can chant sacred texts uh, to remember the Buddha's teachings. We can also recite mantras, which helps to keep the mind focused. In the Tibetan tradition, there's also the tradition of poa, translated as transfer of consciousness. Uh, it's a complex pr practice where we visualize gathering all of the winds of the body into the right, left, and central psychic channels, and then bring the, those winds up to the top of the head, uh, practicing for the moment of death, at which time we'll be able to transfer our consciousness uh, to another rebirth. Um, in the 
Tibetan and as well as the Chinese and Japanese traditions. The idea is actually, if we don't achieve enlightenment in this lifetime, then we would hope to be reborn in a pyramid where practicing the Dharma comes very easily. Everyone's practicing, there are bodhisattva teachers there, um, Buddhas there who teach us, and there are no interferences. You know, you don't have to work, you don't get sick, you just practice Dharma 24 7. So these are some of the various practices that people, uh, Buddhists, may use in, in facing death. So, of course, we can't learn these all at the last moment. We have to practice them while we're still healthy and, and hearty and have energy to practice. And then they'll really come in handy, uh, as I know from my own experience, as we approach death. So I'll take you on a, a little excursion around a couple of Buddhist countries. Um, first to Laos. Uh, a Theravada country uh, where I visited a few times and I was fortunate to participate in a funeral for a man who was not very old, uh, but he passed away, um, sadly, in a brothel. Yeah, it was kind of embarrassing, but the family rallied around and uh, did all of the, the family was prosperous, and so they did all of the rituals necessary, uh, at placing the, the body in a, a mock stupa, or reliquary uh, prior to the crem cremation. Um, on your left, you'll see, on the left of the photo, you'll see the male relatives of the deceased who ordain for a day, they'll ordain for 24 hours in order to accumulate merit, which they will then share or dedicate to the deceased. And they'll put the, the little mock stupa on a truck bed and take it down to the nearest temple for cremation. So here's the son of the man who passed away and his nearest relatives, all the males. Uh, the, the women will also take eight precepts, same idea to create merit on behalf of the deceased, but they don't shave their heads. So then they put, once the stupa is placed in the courtyard of the temple, on the lawn of the temple, then they attach a string that's sort of like a rocket that will ignite the stupa and the corpse that's inside. So this is the way they do the cremation. Okay, let's go to Vietnam then. And one very famous uh, death in Vietnam, of course, was in 1963 with the immolation of a monk who was protesting the oppression of the Buddhists under the Catholic dictator Diem. And to illustrate his the, the grievances of the Vietnamese people, he set himself on fire at an intersection in the middle of Saigon. Now, this was a, a time most of you won't remember, but I was a student at that time. And when we saw these images flash across the TV screen, we took to the streets to try to end that war. So in the end, three million people died, but it could have been many more. And we felt that we had to do something. And so we did our best to try to advocate for peace and um, it's a very sad episode in human history. But that's an example of, of um, self-immolation. Where does this fit in? The Buddhists do not condone suicide in any form. Uh, but in this case, the Vietnamese people regard him as a bodhisattva, someone who was willing to sacrifice his own life for the benefit of countless others. It's a very controversial point. And of course, if we look at the topic of, of death and impermanence, we need to look at the, at the sticky issues also, such as suicide. Um, when we go to China, we find that the predominant practice is pure land. Uh, there are many monasteries that do serious meditation, or at least there were until 1949. But the, the most popular practice amongst Chinese Buddhists is pure land practice. Um, as we mentioned, you know, the idea is that if we practice well um, and, and live a good life, and according to the Chinese call on the name of Amitabha, that at the time of death, we will be able to go to a pure land from which it is very easy to achieve awakening. So this is Amitabha Buddha, usually shown red in color. So this is a Tibetan image, but... Uh, and this is a Chinese image of Amitabha flanked by bodhisattvas. And the Pure Lands are just glorious. You know, they're very beautiful and uh, made of uh, jewels. And the, when the wind blows, the trees sing the Dharma. They, they speak the Dharma, so it's all very beautiful. Um, 
The next um, culture that we'll look at is Tibet and a special practice called sky burial. Now, this is unique to the Tibetan tradition. Um, of course, the, the Tibetans use texts that are written in Tibetan language. That's the, the ones on the bottom, often illustrated. So it's, I think, interesting to see the commonalities among the teachings in the Pali version, the Chinese version, and the Tibetan version. Of course, there are many differences as well, but there's so much common ground in the teachings. Now, Tibet was located at very high altitudes, very cold temperatures. Uh, there were barely any trees in central Tibet uh, for cremation, and the ground was so hard it was next to impossible to dig it for burial. So there evolved a practice of feeding the corpse to the wild animals, the wild birds, um, such as vultures. This may look really gruesome to us and understandably. But when we think about Buddhist philosophy, once the consciousness has left the body, then the body is useless. It's just a pile of bones and flesh. Uh, whether it gets cremated, whether it gets buried, or whether it gets offered as the last act of generosity uh, is more or less irrelevant. But the Tibetans would, in, in the past, would opt for feeding the birds and animals as the last act of generosity. And so this was quite common. There was a special class of people called rogapas, those who care for the corpses, and they performed special rituals for the deceased. They were in charge of unwrapping the body, mixing it with barley flour, and feeding it to the birds and wild animals. Whoops, I'm oh, going backwards. Oh, okay, so this is the Tibetan plateau. You can see it's very high altitude, and their options for, for disposing of corpses were limited. Hmm, I guess they're going backwards. Okay, now, um, maybe due to the pre-Buddhist religion in Tibet called Bun, the Tibetans have always been very interested in the topic of death. The, the Bun tradition also, they had a uh, system of well, multiple souls and all of this. But in any case, when the Tibetans adopted Buddhism, they really looked seriously at Buddhist attitudes towards death and dying. So. And then to practice, they tried to verify these teachings through their own experience. So they, they developed uh, the, this uh, practice of watching the dissolution of the five aggregates uh, associated with five basic wisdoms, associated with uh, the four elements, four or sometimes five elements, that are correlated with the six sense bases and the objects of the sense bases. So, we actually practice meditating on the dissolution of the form, say the body that we just uh, reviewed during our meditation, uh, but we understand that it is impermanent and dissolves. As the form aggregate dissolves, we see a, a, an image, like an apparition, and this is correlated with the dissolution of the earth element. So we see certain visual images. Um, the second is the feelings of the body dissolve. There arises this basic wisdom of equality. This correlates with the dissolution of the water element. The body dries up, becomes immobile, and our sense of hearing uh, dissolves. We can't hear sounds properly anymore. When the third aggregate, the discriminations or recognitions aggregate dissolves, the basic wisdom of analysis arises, and the fire element uh, dissolves. So the body becomes very cold. Mm -hmm. um, the sense of smell uh, disintegrates. We don't. Uh, we aren't able to smell things anymore. When the fourth aggregate dissolves, the compositional factors or the mental formations, then we see we experience this basic wisdom of achieving activities, and the wind element dissolves. So we we feel that we're being buffeted around by the wind. So in this case, the sense of taste and also bodily sensations are dissolved. We can no longer taste things, we can no longer feel touches. And then the consciousness dissolves. And that's a, a very complex practice. So the idea is that we, we actually mimic these practices, we imitate, we practice uh, the dissolution of the aggregates, so that when we're dying, we'll recognize these different stages of the dying practice. We're no longer uh, in a state of fear 
or uncertainty. We know exactly what's going on, so we can actually observe it. And without fear or any kind of um, agitation, we can move on to the next phase, which um, hopefully will be a positive, a pleasant uh, rebirth. You know, the, the Tibetans have a pretty elaborate um, system of embryology, amazing for the time. They, they saw how the uh, consciousness enters the, the womb of the mother uh, during the coupling of the husband and wife, as they say. And you can see here the incipient being who's been looking for a rebirth and then sees a couple in union. And if it seems to be uh, a favorable uh, home life or family, then they would enter into the womb of the mother and take conception at that point. Um, so uh, moving, this skips a bit of that process, it's rather elaborate, but we also find in many cultures, but um, especially perhaps in Tibet, relics of the dead. We can, we find that even after cremating the body, often there are things that look like bone or turquoise or different uh, gemstones even that remain even after the cremation is complete. Sometimes too, for example, in Taiwan and in China, sometimes we find that bodies don't decompose. Um, this was um, an example from Taiwan. I happened to be there when the, this, um, the body was discovered because the monk had been a lay person and his, he passed away, he became a monk and then he passed away. And some years after his passing, his daughter was cleaning the, the grave and she accidentally broke open the, the casket and there was her father sitting there in meditation. The body had not decomposed. So there are three like this in Taiwan. I've seen all three of them. And I've also seen one in, uh, in China at um, Zhuashan, but there are more. So sometimes, and, and this is considered a mark of the purity of the person, the purity of heart of this practitioner that the body does not decompose. In fact, they just found the body of a nun in Iowa. It was in the newspaper. Maybe it was not so recent, but um, a Catholic nun whose body did not decompose. And that has become, a, I mean, her monastery has become a sacred site. And she was uh, African American. So you, you can probably find that online, um, the story. Okay, this is another example from up in the Himalayas. And I want to leave time for questions, but um, this is an example too of a practitioner who was buried inside a stupa up on the uh, in the mountains, the Himalayas, just about three miles from the Tibetan border on the Indian side of the border. And during an earthquake, the stupa cracked open and they found this monk's body. Interestingly, they had had a song in the village that um, that honored this monk, and um, they would they sang the song, but they didn't they weren't aware that the the monk's body was right there in the stupa. But then when they carbon dated the body, they found it was 600 years old. But when you look closely, you'll see it looks like his hair is still growing. And he'd been sitting in meditation. He actually had his prayer beads in his hand. So that's uh, another. It was just when the air hit the body, then it started to dry up. It looked very lifelike when they found it. Another example is from Russia, from Siberia. This uh, abbot of the, one of the largest monasteries of, of Russia uh, was um, passed away and his body did not decompose. They had to hide it from the Soviets and they just uh, revealed it again. Usually women aren't allowed in maybe, you know, once a year, but they let me go in to pay my respect to, to this um, great practitioner. So now another example, of course, um, of rebirth and not an example of a of, um, corpse that doesn't decompose, but uh, an example of rebirth is the Dalai Lama lineage. Okay, so this is the 13th Dalai Lama, who unfortunately passed away before he could complete the reforms he had in mind. And um, he took rebirth in the form of a, a young child in northeastern Tibet, the one his, this is the Dalai Lama in his mother's arms, when he was just a wee baby. And he was recognized as the rebirth of the 13th and taken to Lhasa, where he was enthroned, and now he's 88 years old, and we're fortunate to have him in the world. Now, this is a, a, a portrayal of the Pure Lands that um, are so popular in, in China, Taiwan, Korea, Japan, Vietnam. And so if we don't achieve awakening in this lifetime, uh, 
they would hope to go to a pure land and where it's quite easy to achieve awakening. So this is the Buddha that we will all become, the awakened being we will all eventually become. And uh, one, one last uh, point is this open discussions on death. Now, when I was a kid, talking about death was taboo. And I think in many cultures it is, especially in Chinese culture. Gee, um, I've mistakenly raised the topic in, in um, some discussions with Chinese friends and really no one wanted to talk about that. But it's things are changing, times are changing, and it's becoming more uh, accessible, easier to find people who are willing to talk about that. So at the Zen Hospice of San Diego, they want to change the way we die by supporting people at the end of life with mindful and compassionate care. Through conversation, we bring death out into the open. So if we don't talk about it, it remains something very scary. But if we talk about it, then we make friends with it then it's much easier to accept, both for ourselves and others. And of course, there are lots of cartoons about death, and here's one. Thank goodness you're here. I can't accomplish anything unless I have a deadline. So um, that's the end of my PowerPoint, and I'll come back into the room and well, we can open it up for questions. Yes, Sophia, you want to take it from here? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, Venerable, for that very interesting PowerPoint. Um, just a reminder, if you have any questions, please feel free to pop in the chat, either to everyone or to myself, if you don't want to share it with everyone. And here in person, we have paper and pen on that table. If not, if you have a question, please let me know, and I can either unmute for you to ask a question, or you can ask me, and I'll ask Venerable as well. Yeah. Uh, Venerable, we have a few questions already. Um, so first one, hi, I would like to ask Venerable, it is so deeply sad and gloomy to lose a family member we have lived with since we were born. How should we train ourselves to let go of this attachment and to have the right view about this? Well, okay, there are so many practices. And of course, this meditation on, on death and impermanence is really valuable. Um, we can also look at the nature of attachment, which the Buddha was very explicit about. Um, he taught that the more we are attached to someone, the more we'll suffer when we part from them, right? So we want to generate loving kindness to the person we love as much as possible, devoid of attachment, okay? So loving kindness and, and attachment are different animals. Loving kindness is a wholesome mental factor, whereas Attachment is problematic. Attachment means that it's not pure love. There's some expectation involved. And in the example that the, the questioner cites, the um, death of a loved one, I mean, there's something there we want them to remain because we want them in our lives. So this is what we need to examine and, uh, and eventually recognize that the, the more we are attached to them, the more distress we'll feel when they're gone. So then people ask, well, oh, does that mean we can't love anybody? No, not at all. It means that we need to recognize that love is a very fuzzy word. It can mean many different things in many different contexts. So that's why I think the, the word metta is so useful, this idea of friendliness or loving kindness, because it's clear that we're not talking about a romantic attachment here. Uh, we're talking about something that's purely from the heart. So we want to practice with that while people are alive. Right? So, and it has many benefits too, not just only at the time of death, but even in our everyday lives, if we're able to see people with loving kindness rather than through the eyes of expectation, what can they do for us? You know? We love them purely, completely with our hearts, and that's the best kind of love. Thank you, Venerable. That was such a beautiful description of metta and how we can practice that <laughs> with the knowledge of death that's inevitable in all of our lives. Um, just following on from that, actually, I am curious about if those of us have it, being able to practice metta while our family members are alive and after they pass, often people can feel like there's a hole and their lives are never the same again. How can we kind of manage with this feeling of not being home again or really missing that person? Okay. Well, I, I think that, uh, to be honest, we'd have to recognize that there is some attachment there. The hole that we're feeling 
is something that we expect to be filled by someone. Whereas in fact, that that should, that, this is um, a kind of distorted perception of our, uh, of our relationship with the person. Even if someone has passed away, we can still send them loving kindness. We don't stop loving them the minute they die. That would, that would, that doesn't make any sense at all. In fact, wherever they may be, in whatever realm of existence they may be, we can still be sending them loving kindness. And that's what we do when we chant the metta chant or chant the metta sutta, then we send loving kindness to all sentient beings, including our own near ones and dear ones. And that's something to look at too. Why is it that we mourn the ones that are in our own family, in our own circle of friends, but we don't care about the other 8 billion? That's rather heartless, isn't it? I mean, if, if we want to develop loving kindness, then we should include all living beings and not just human beings either. And then as, our, as, as we include more and more beings in our circle of loving kindness, then it becomes easier and easier. And it also helps to erase some of the attachments that we feel. One of the bodhisattva vows in the Tibetan tradition, there are several different lineages of bodhisattva vows, is feeling closeness to some and distance from others. Is a, is a breach of the bodhisattva vows. One with, bodhi, with bodhicitta is to direct this loving kindness to all beings equally. And that's quite a challenge. But you can see right away just by using critical analysis that that's going to help to erase some of these attachments to our near and dear ones. But we can send loving kindness to them because they're right in our view. But we don't stop there. We continue to expand our loving kindness. Thank you, Venerable. It's beautiful. Let us all grow our ball of loving kindness and our emotional, <laughs> emotional uh, ball of loving kindness and expand it wider and wider. Yeah. Um, so I think that relates to a question that actually follows up is um, when we think about death as well in your everyday life, um, especially if you've experienced the death of a family member, the topic of death can loom. Um, in our lives too, as we go on our lives, uh, we remember death. So how can we, what are some of the practices that can really use this uh, memory, uh, this reminder of death to strengthen our motivation to practice uh, in our human lives? Well, yes, I agree that the passing of a loved one can be a good reminder. It's a good wake up call, actually. And not just um, the passing of a close relative. Even when we read the papers, you know, uh, when we think of the, we, we see instances of, of death every day, right? In the paper, of course, celebrities are one thing, or now 10,000 10, Palestinians dead. I mean, we can use all of these as a reminder that death will come to us all. Uh, sometimes it will come peacefully, sometimes it will come violently, we don't know. You know, we just had the wildfires on Maui, and no one expected that, that over 100 people would die in a, in a flash with little or no warning. So in fact, this can come at any time. And um, I just went, I just barely made it myself <laughs> and the, a couple a month ago. Uh, they didn't, uh, they were surprised that I, that I made it. So this can happen to any of us. And so anytime we see even the death of an insect, I mean, I see these insects flying around the lamp. And it's sort of like the firefly to the flame. They don't realize that the flame is so dangerous, that they're risking their lives. They're attracted to the flame. It's a kind of an, an analogy to the way we play around in samsara. We're going to, you know, our favorite restaurants and our favorite ice cream store and to visit our friends and talk story and, and waste time. I mean, we even say that, right? Um, and so that's rather ignorant, actually, if we think about it carefully through Dharma eyes. I mean, we want to be aware when we see an insect, a dead insect, instead of feeling revulsion, we should think, oh, thank you for this teaching. Just like this insect, I will also soon be in the same situation. We can also look at the plants. I'm, I'm living on, you know, in the country, and every day I see the, the leaves wither, and the flowers wither, and of course, new ones in their place. But uh, the, the plants also die, and that's also a reminder. I used to pull off all the dead leaves, and then I saw one of my friends who's an artist, and she would leave the dead leaves on the on the plant. And I thought, oh, that's really wise, you know. She's not going to miss an opportunity to recall and and reflect on uh, on death. That's very smart, very wise. Hmm? 
So in these ways, we prepare for death. We prepare ourselves for the death of our loved ones and for our own death. That's a smart thing to do. Very smart and wise indeed. Um, and that naturally leaks with another question someone had, which is, does Venerable have any advice on how to deal with fear and pain? I'm assuming that's associated with thinking about death. And I guess you've answered a bit of it, which is reflecting on permanence and so on. But do you have any other kinds of advice for that? Well, I think it's natural to experience fear around death because it's the unknown. Imagine primitive peoples, I mean, say in the early days, they had no idea what was going on. You know, one minute a person is warm and talking and moving around and suddenly they're stone cold. Where did they go? It must have been very frightening. Hmm? And um, even today, I mean, how do we prepare for something like that? Um, Oh, there's so many ways to answer this question. <laughs> yeah. um, I think that um, fear comes from attachment, attachment to ourselves and attachment to our relatives. But there's more to it. Um, there's a concept called prapancha. Prapancha means elaborations. Uh, elaborations or mental constructs or, uh, yeah, it's sort of like death in itself is a, is a sad thing. It's an unfortunate thing for most of us. Um, but instead of just accepting death as a reality, we elaborate on it. You know, what's going to happen to me? And this can happen when we get sick, even if we, you know, we get a cold or we get, um, heaven forbid, get COVID or something. We don't just suffer from the illness. We suffer from our own fears that we ourselves are creating around the incident. You see, so these kinds of mental constructs or mental elaborations cause us a lot of misery. In fact, what it means is we're compounding our own misery. Getting sick is bad enough. But then if we fall into the syndrome of, oh, what's going to happen? The medical bills are going to come. I'm going to, I'm going to go into debt and then I'm going to, um, then I'm going to be miserable and, um, you know, I won't have a place to live. And, you know, on top of the illness, the suffering of the illness itself, we, make ourselves even more miserable, which is foolish, very foolish. It's called, yeah, papancha. So, um, so that's one, one way to look at it. Um, the other thing is that fear doesn't help anything. Fear doesn't help us. Uh, it's, it's not to our benefit. It clouds our thinking. It obscures our, uh, our wisdom. What are we afraid of, actually? It's important to, to delve into that topic. We're afraid of losing ourself, but then the self itself is a construct. It's a fiction, because when we go to look for a self, we don't find one, right? So we're attached to something, and we're afraid of losing something that in fact does not exist. So again, this is a, it's foolishness. This is why we study the Buddha's teachings. The more we study, the more we understand the way in which we exist. If we understood that we're, we exist as impermanent, uh, fleeting entities, and we wouldn't be surprised when we get sick and, um, and face death. The other part of the question is about the pain of, of, of death, the pain of aging, illness, aging, and death. And um, in fact, of course, no one can avoid the, this pain. But these days, they do have medications that help a lot. And of course, you have to be careful with them because some of them are highly addictive. And in the hospitals, they were even giving me these highly addictive substances. And I, I, I said, oh, wait a second, isn't this what I've been reading about in the New York Times that, you know, 300,000 people have died this year from this, this uh, fentanyl or whatever, and, and, and you're giving it to, to me to take? And they said, yeah, well, if you just take a little bit, it's okay. Uh, okay. But, you know, we do have to be careful with these substances. But to a great extent, pain can be managed. And um, discomfort is another thing. We might be uncomfortable, but raw pain can often be managed by medications. Not for everyone. There are exceptions, but usually it's pretty good these days. In comparison from, say, the time of the Buddha when they, they only had herbs to fall back on, right? So now that's talking about physical pain, but then we also have to talk about mental pain. Ah, the pain of losing a loved one. But that sends us full circle back to the topic of attachment. And if we can replace our attachment with pure loving kindness, that will help. That will go a long way to relieving our, our distress. Well, thank you for answering the multiple dimensions of that question, Venerable. 
you really <laughs> managed to spend 10 minutes to um, answer a very, very big question. Um, actually related with the final part of your, uh, the medicine, we actually have a question on what is your opinion on euthanasia? Well, on the topic of euthanasia, I think I would go with the traditional Buddhist view, um, which, you know, is based on the first precept, which is not to take life, not to harm, not to take life. Um, it's a tricky one because sometimes people think that out of compassion, the most compassionate thing to do would be to help the, the animal or help the person to, to die. But we don't really know for sure whether we're helping them or not. It may relieve, it may relieve their pain in this lifetime, but we don't know what the next lifetime holds for that animal or that person. It could be worse, right? And that's one part of it. The, the other part is that as human beings, every moment is precious because every moment is an opportunity for us to, to practice, to learn. And when I mentioned that death opportunity of a lifetime, the, the opportunity to uh, develop insight into suffering, to develop insight into impermanence, to develop compassion for the suffering of others. I mean, I'm not the only person dying. There are thousands of people dying at the same time at this moment throughout the world, and often in much worse circumstances than, than mine. And so when we think in this way, in fact, through Dharma eyes, we wouldn't want to waste any time. The human lifetime is so precious. We don't know when we're going to get another one. We've been working how many lifetimes to get this human rebirth, and now we should make the most of it. So this is the traditional view, and I am quite, I've thought about it a lot, and I, I really feel that, it's, um, yeah, it seems to hold true for me. Now, of course, if someone were in horrible pain, things might look different. But the pain is often psychological rather than physical. When they do studies of euthanasia in, say, the Netherlands, where it's been legal for some time, they find that usually the decision to, to end one's life is more about not wanting to be a burden to people uh, or feeling meaningless, that their lives are meaningless not so much about the pain. So if we can address, especially as Buddhists, if we can address these issues, how to make people feel comfortable and, and, and if not happy, at least content with their lives, rather than feeling a burden to others, um, if we can help people feel that their lives are meaningful and help them in some way or another um, to make their lives meaningful up to the end, then that would be a more sort of wholesome and positive way to look at the situation. This is a tricky, tricky question. I mean, it's uh, not an easy one to resolve and there will be other opinions, but I just set forth my own opinion, which is based on the traditional Buddhist texts. So there was a case, you know, at the time of the Buddha, he taught this uh, teaching on no self. And then he went for alms round. And when he came back, he found that 60 monks had committed suicide. They misunderstood the teaching. When he said there's no self, they thought, oh, well, it doesn't matter. We can just, you know, hang it up. <laughs> but he said, oh, no, what were they thinking? You know, they completely misunderstood what I, what I was trying to say. And so he, he made it very clear that taking one's own life was what, not a good idea. So we have, we have cases from the text like that. Uh, there's one counter example, which is the example of an arhat, an arhat who was in terrible pain at the end of life. And he fell on a sword and died. And the Buddha did not condemn that, that arhat. So the, the reasoning that people give is that, well, he was already an arhat. He had no attachment to the body. Um, and, and so the body was basically useless because he'd already achieved liberation. So that's how they explain it. But it's interesting that there is a counterexample in the text themselves. The Buddhists really try to get us thinking, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Venerable. Yes, we definitely need to know about the rule, but also the exception to the rule. <laughs> um, we also have a question. Oh, we have um, that person saying, thanks, very useful. Um, and we also have a final question, which is, um, how can we develop the conviction that death is not the end and that we will come back if not fully enlightened? So some kind of hope to end this talk, right? Some kind of way of going, yeah, like... We're making, right. <laughs> yeah, making friends with the whole topic, aren't we? Well, <laughs> this, um, this question actually hinges on the idea of rebirth. And 
whether or not we, I mean, whether or not rebirth is a reality. So I think that this um, question depends a lot on our religious background. Um, in most of South Asia, the Hindus, the, the Jains, the Sikhs, the Buddhists, all just naturally accept the idea of rebirth. It's just, it, it's always, the idea has always been around. And they also have examples of young children who remember their past lives. You see it in the Indian newspapers quite a lot, that a young girl will say, you're not my real mom and dad. My real mom and dad live at such and such an address. I want to go visit them. And sometimes they'll think, oh, this kid is, is crazy. <laughs> you know, they're hallucinating. But some of the parents will actually follow up and take the child to that address. And then there, there are a couple of famous cases where a little girl went in the house. She called her mother and father by name, her sisters and brothers by name. She went to her room where, and opened a, a trunk in which were her school books. She knew exactly where her things were. And so they actually took her up to meet the Dalai Lama because he heard about the story. And so she, they, they took her up for, um, to share her story and to get a blessing. So um, if we don't accept the idea of rebirth, the Dharma teachings still work. I mean, to do wholesome deeds and to refrain from unwholesome deeds, um, to purify the mind, this is the teaching of all the Buddhas. So if we don't accept the idea of rebirth, we can just set that aside for now and practice the teachings, learn to develop our mind, concentration, um, loving kindness, compassion, and all of these wonderful mental attributes. On the other hand, understanding the, the wheel of rebirth does help us in that it, dis, it, it helps us to refrain from unwholesome actions because we don't want to keep going round and round and round in this wheel. And so it's useful to understand the, the law of cause and effect and ultimately the law of cause and effect um, spills over into future lifetimes so the, the sometimes you the the um, mamas will talk about two twins identical twins raised in the same family almost identical dna same education same food same everything and yet they're completely different people how do you explain it and they will say well it depends on their actions in previous lifetimes. Why are some kids just violent from a young age and other children are just, you know, pure, purely affectionate and kind? How do you explain that? Mm -hmm. But if it takes time to get used to, that's fine. Take your time with it. But there is a lot of reasoning that goes to support the idea of rebirth. So it's worth giving some thought. Thank you, Venerable. And Loti, I know it's late and over there at 12 a.m. or something at the moment. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, um, we'll just wrap up. But before we go, we'd love to hear about the charities. Every time you talk about your charities, I get quite inspired. Um, Sakya Dita, Jeb Yang, anything else you would like to talk about, please share with us. Okay, thank you for asking. Um, we've been doing um, a lot of different work for Buddhist women in the world. Uh, previously, women didn't have many opportunities. Um, they were not allowed to go to the learning centers that were purely for monks. And so we thought, well, let's uh, let's see what we can do here. <laughs> because w w Western women have been so fortunate to get at least 12 years of, of education uh, and to see young girls with no opportunities just somehow didn't feel right. So we started um, un sort of uniting worldwide, uh, women from different countries and sharing our experiences. And we decided that we really uh, wanted to help Buddhist women internationally. And the most important thing would be education. So everybody has their own projects. Some developed retreat centers, some developed monasteries, some developed uh, women's shelters, some are translators, some are researchers. Everybody has a different uh, passion. But um, my particular passion is education for for women for, and girls. So that's where the first one, when we got together internationally, this is Sakadita, International Association of Buddhist Women, literally Daughters of the Buddha. Uh, we meet every two years. The most recent conference was in Korea and 5,000 people showed up at the opening ceremony. It was amazing and so inspiring, incredibly inspiring. So um, personally, I've also dedicated um, many years to uh, opening up opportunities for young women to study in places where they never had any education opportunities. So uh, mostly in the Indian Himalayas, but also in Bangladesh and 
uh, also helping in Nepal and Vietnam and Mongolia. So these projects are going very well. We have 12 monasteries in India, and they're studying the Buddhist uh, text, Buddhist philosophy, which was just not available for women until recently. And every day now they, they have uh, WhatsApp and they show me, you know, their their exams and what they're learning and it's so inspiring so um the other project is a an institute in bodh gaya if you can believe in 2500 years there had never been a monastery for women in bodh gaya <laughs> only for men so in 1995 we started uh, uh friends of uh, the sangha or the daughter of Emperor Ashoka, and the nuns from the Himalayas come down in the winter. During the winter months, it's so freezing cold up there. There's no, you know, water, the food, very little food, no medical care, and, and the, we can't get teachers up there. So we bring them down to Bodh Gaya. Right now, there are about a hundred nuns studying at Sangamitra. Yeah, and they're all so happy to get this opportunity. So then the fourth one is this project here in Hawaii, because people kept saying, why do you only help people in other countries? Why don't you help people here? So I thought, okay, so when my mom passed away, I got this piece of land, and I thought that it would be a great idea to have sustainable meditation center here in Hawaii. And so I invite all of you to please come and visit if you get over to Hawaii, and we welcome you. Thank you, Venerable. And what's the name of the meditation center you're located at? Huh? It's uh, well, it's Sakadita Hawaii, which is the branch of Sakadita International, and the peace center is called Nai Peace Center. Nai means peace in Hawaiian, mm -hmm. so it's um, yeah, and we have ocean view, mountain view. It's amazing, and papayas, and you know all the fruits hanging on the trees, and we can live very happily <laughs> and meditate. So we're doing lots of different programs, including programs for the military, <laughs> which is wow. Right? Oh. Yeah, they t we teach them to meditate. They love it. Oh, <laughs> they need it too. <laughs> Loving yeah. like this for what they do for yeah. everybody else. And uh, I finished actually um, find the links for these charities. So please, if you're interested, check them out. The, the links are in the description. I mean, sorry, in the comments. And oh, wow. So, so many beautiful initiatives and helping so many beings in this world. Um, really wonderful. Thank you so much venerable um and thank you so much for joining us tonight we know that you just came out of the hospital and it's 12 a.m where you're at yet you still joined and gave us such a wonderful talk on how to make friends with death through impermanence through meta through attachment through reflection on what death actually is outside of the concepts that we've been taught um so that we can have less fear and pain associated with it as well so much wisdom for us to practice afterwards um and thank you to have your acquaintance tonight and thank you so much for everyone for joining us and for your awesome questions as well <laughs> so before we finish off venerable um do you want to do a dedication of merits please or a prayer Okay, um, I'd be happy to. Um, my voice sounds like a frog, so please forgive me. But, um, I'll do my best. <coughs> okay. <clears throat> so we want to rejoice um, in using our time in the most beneficial way. And then we want to share the merit we've accumulated with all living beings. Gewadi nyurdu da Lama sange du gyune Do wa chi yang ma lupa Ke ki sa la pa by virtue of the merit that we have accumulated, may we achieve the state of perfect awakening in order to liberate all living beings from suffering, leaving not one behind. 